communicating to the browser something, some specific information that will help, I'm sorry, I said the client communicating to the browser, the client communicating to the web server that will tell the web server some important information necessary for the web server to prepare the web page for the client. Remember that with server-side scripting, uh, the page is not pre-made and sitting out there. Instead, there are instructions in programs written in a, a number of possible languages that take information from the client and custom make a web page for them. So for example, if you do a Google search on CSS, you'll get the results about CSS. If you do a Google search on HTML, you'll get the results about HTML. If you log into Canvas, you'll get your information. If I log in, I'll get my information. How does that happen? Well, you give that information to the server via a form, typically. And so we went over this example last time. And let's, let's look at it again to make sure that we get um, the, the main idea um, that were the main ideas that were covered last time. All right, there's our form, not too impressive, just one single field on it, and it's a text box. And we can go and we can type in something that we want to search for. Let's say HTML forms, and click go and do a search, and we get the results back from the browser about, or from the web server. Why do I keep saying browser instead of web server today? We get the results from the web server um, about the thing that we search for. So let's review the main parts of this form. First of all, we have the form tag itself. And the form tag goes around everything that we're going to send to the server. You can almost think of it like an envelope. All right, you know, an envelope, everything that you're going to mail to someone, you have stuff inside the envelope. You don't, if you have five sheets of paper, you don't give five envelopes and put the first sheet in one and the first, second sheet in another. You take all five sheets, fold them up, and put them in the one envelope. Same thing here. So if you're sending a bunch of stuff to the server, um, typically you would have one form tag around everything that you want to send to the server all at once. It is possible to have two forms on the same page. An example for that would be on some sites where you go to uh, their register page, there's a section where you can register if you're a new user to that site. And on the same page, there's a section that you can log on if you're already an, uh, uh, um, a user. That would probably be two forms, all right, because one completes one function that is registering you for the site. The other performs another function that is logging you onto the site. So in that case, you're sending the data to two different places, depending if you're already a user or if you're making a new user. So in that case, there would be two form tags. But oftentimes, there will be um, one form tag uh, because you're sending one sort of data to the user, completing one request to the user. So the form tag goes around all the things. Inside the form, there'll be uh, a bunch of stuff, all right, potentially. In this case, we have two things. And they're both with input tags. The input tag is used for a lot of things, but it's not the only tag that we use inside a form, all right? Um, one of the tags that we use inside a form is input type equals text. And that is a plain old text box. Um, a text box is just that, a text box, meaning that we can put anything we want to in it. Um, if we want to put, if we want to force the user to put a number in, for example, if there was like a field for your age and you didn't want someone to just type anything in, but um, you would uh, want them to type in a number in, then we'd have to do something else to keep it from allowing alphabetical numbers or not alphabetical numbers, non-numeric uh, non data, yes? If you want to manipulate the size of the text box, well, that would uh, manipulate the size of the text box could mean two things. Because right now, with the text box, if we look at it, all right, 
this, by the size of the text box, do you mean how many characters you can put into it? Or do you mean how much space it takes up on the screen? How much space, how much space up? How do you think you do it? Yeah, through CSS. Questions like that, you should, um, the first thing you should do is think to yourself, is this a CSS or an HTML question? So when you talk about it's going to take up a certain amount of space, that is, um, that relates to how it's going to look, right? So therefore, automatically in your head, it should be like, well, that's a CSS question. And I'll go in and I'll put some CSS in. I won't bother to create a new, pay, uh, a new CSS file. Uh, but I'll just go and add to this page some CSS code. And I could do this. Now, I could say everything that's an input have a width of 100 pixels, maybe. Now, the only thing with that is, if you notice, that made the text box 100 pixels, but also made the button, right? Because the button is also an input tag. So how could we get around that? How could we get around the button? Yes. We could use an ID, or we could use a class. All right? So I could put ID equals search term. And then I could put a style rule for things that have an ID of search term. And then it would make that one that big, but it would leave the other one at its default size. Um, the other thing I could do is with the class. Now in this case, uh, and I'll call the class um, text entry. I would be inclined to use a class instead of an ID. Because remember, there's liable to be other things on the page that I want to make the same size, that I want to treat the same. So I would use class equals text entry. And then create the style rule for text entry, and it would work the same. Yes? Can you go over again the name equals to like why? OK, excellent question. The question was, why does the name equal Q? And that's a great question, because if we change it to something else, I'll literally change it to something else, all right? It's not going to work. So it doesn't know what to do with it. So it just displays the Bing home page. If, on the other hand, it's Q, it will work, and it will do what we want it to. I didn't want to search for Q. Uh, search for CSS. There we go. And then it did the search for CSS. So the question is, is why did I put Q in there? All right. You have to remember that the client and the, the form on the client side and the server side script are a team. They're working together. All right. And they have to be calling things the same thing for it to work. So. The value that you put for name has to be the value that the server side is expecting. All right. Now, the question is, is how do you know what the server side is expecting? Well, a couple of things, one of two things. Either you're the person that's writing both the client and the server side, so you can make it whatever you want, and you'll just make sure that it matches up. Or the person that writes the server side code will tell you, make the search term called Q and make this field called this, and make that field called that. Now, in our case, uh, since we reversed engineered it, since we looked at a Bing query, I'll show you how I got Q. I went to Bing, and 
and I did a query. And I looked at the query string, because I know the query string is how the client and the server can communicate. I looked at all this stuff here, and wow, that doesn't look, that looks confusing. But notice on the query string what we have right here. Right after the question mark, we have Q equals HTML. That told me that the server's expecting the thing that we're searching for to be HTML. And I didn't bother with the other stuff, because I tried just that, and just that was all you need to do to do a search. So what I did is I looked to see at the URL that was being made, and I said, well, Q equals HTML, you need to put, and I recognize that HTML is what I put in the box, so therefore, I must have to call that text box Q. All right? So I called it Q. The other part of it that I got is the part before the query string told me the action of the form. In other words, the action of the form is the URL we send it to. Well, the URL that we send it to is www.bing slash search. So again, either you're the person doing this, and you'll know both of them, all right, or someone will tell you, or in this case, I reverse engineered. I just looked at it and says, OK, the script that processes Bing searches must be called bing.com slash search. So we're all set with that. I call it Q. I send it to that. The method of get means that it has to be on the query string passed. There's two ways that um, you can pass data to the server. One, it shows it on the query string. The other way, it doesn't show it on the query string. The other way is post. And unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, that will not work. Again, we're back to the home page. But when you use post, it's not visible on the query string. But we have to use get, because again, the client and the server are working as a team. So we have to give it what it expects for it to work. All right. Questions on this? No, this is, this is all HTML. This is all HTML. Now, we can have more stuff on a form. So I have another example. Or you can do a search in a different language. So I can search for HTML, and I can search for French. All right. Oh, but that didn't work. But that didn't work. Well, how can we tell what we need to put in the work? All right, well, let's go to Bing. Actually, we're doing a Google search here. All right, I switched it over, switched the example over to Google. So let's go to advanced search. And let's search for HTML. Let's do some reverse engineering. Let's say I want French. I deliberately like pretended I was confused there. All right. Never mind, it's early in the morning, and I only had one cup of the coffee, and I actually am a little confused. 
all right? <laughs> but I was faking that, all right? Pretending like I didn't know what to put in. And actually, I wasn't faking that, because I really don't remember what I put in. Because the last time I did this example was over the summer, and that was months ago. So the bottom line is, what do I have to put in to get French to work? So again, I'm going to reverse engineer it. So I'm going to go to Google, type advanced search, and I notice that the, what I need to type in, we can see up in the query string, is not any of those things, but lang underscore fr. So if I want to search for French, I have to type in lang underscore fr. So I'll go back to my page, and I'll type in lang, I think dash, not underscore, fr. Maybe it was underscore. All right, and there we go. We have it in French, finally. All right. Why do you suppose I did that? Mm, not really. What I was attempting to demonstrate is that the text box isn't the right thing to use in this case. Why? Because it's not intuitive what you have to type in there. I mean, someone might think you have to type in French, the word French. Someone might think you have to type in France. Someone might think you have to type in FR. All right? As it turns out, there's a certain number of accept acceptable values, all right? And you've got to know exactly what those values are for this to work. So if I type in Lang, under, uh, underscore ES. That gives me Spanish search results. Lang underscore IC. Whoa, we'll see what that will give us. It uh, doesn't really give us anything. Yes? Mm -hmm. So, like, if they were to put and like search that, it would use the browser's like already made settings to like yes. search for that word. Yeah. In other words, um, what, uh, remember the diagram I drew last time? I, I said that the client. In fact, I probably have it right over here. All right. The client sends a request through the internet to the server, and the server does its thing and makes an HTML page. One thing I mentioned is that the client, when it sends the request over, it sends some other information. It sends the information from the form. It sends the IP address, which can be used to determine a location. And so what I'm sure Google would use is if you were in um, France or if you're in Germany or if you're in Mexico or whatever, it would see your IP address, figure out where you were, and give you the, uh, give you the results in the language that um, you were expecting them. All right. But still, what if a Spanish-speaking person was Googling here in the US? Or a, you know, a US uh, English-speaking person was Googling in Iceland or whatever? Uh, so that's what the advanced search does, it gives you. So what I was trying to do is do a piece of the advanced search from Google without doing the entire thing. So let's see. Let's, let's do a couple more advanced searches, and let's get some more language codes. Let's see if we wanted traditional Chinese. All right. Our, lang ha our language has to be lang underscore zh. And lr is the name of the text box. So if I do a search here and I do lang underscore zh,
lang underscore zh. All right. So if I put in into my form, search for HTML, language lang underscore zh, it will give me Chinese results or not. Oh, dash TW. It gets more complicated. So there's the Chinese results. Let's do one more country so that we. This could be. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it could be. Um, again, accessibility typically, when you use that term, you are uh, relating, uh, you, you're typically talking about um, um, people with different disabilities. Uh, and, and speaking a different language isn't really a disability. Um, that would be making your site more usable, though, definitely. One thing that's good, um, and again, it doesn't do a perfect job, but, but Google Translate is something that a lot of times, if you, if you display a page that's different than the language that you're expecting it in, it will ask you if you want to translate. So let's do one more search, and then I'm going to make my I'm going to make changes to this form. All right, so we search for Icelandic, and Lang equals is. So I have three languages that I know. I'm going to assume English is en. I got French, which is fr, and I don't. I'm writing this down for my purposes. I guess I could. I'll put it on the screen. So we had four languages, let's say, that we're interested in. So this text box, we could type any old thing in, right? Because who knows what they want to search for? They could search for anything. But the language has to be one from a predefined list of things. Okay? So that's a little different than um, the search term. A text box isn't a good idea for that because it has to be one of the allowable languages. Whoops. And let's assume these are the only four allowable languages that we're interested in. All right? We'll, throw, we'll put Spanish in there as well, just to have five. So what do we do? How do we make this more usable instead of requiring people to know the precise language code they have to enter? How can we make the form more usable where you wouldn't have to know the exact language code to enter? Yeah, exactly. Add a different kind of form control and specifically like a drop-down list. So drop-down lists are when you have a field that can only take one of a certain number of values. All right? The search term is free form, right? You could, you could search for anything, right? And therefore, um, you know, is a, a text box is good for that. For a name, your name could be anything. So you'd use a text box for name. Um, your address could be anything. All right. Um, your city could be anything. Your state, well, there's only one of a certain number of choices, right? Um, and so on. So for fields that there's only a certain number of choices, and it has to be one of those choices, a text box isn't a good idea. There's a couple of options that you have, and the first one is a drop down. So let's go and let's make this field a drop down. A drop-down is not done with the input tag. A drop-down is done with the select tag. This is a case of like, don't blame me. I'm not the one that made this up. All right? I'm just telling you. So you have a select tag. And the select tag 
can also have a name and an ID. And again, the name is, is what is going to be sent to the server. I think that's all we need. Now, a select has a list of options. All right? And the options look like this. Okay, the options look like this. Options have two parts, all right? They have a part that's the value of the option, then they have a part that's the text of the option, all right? Between the start and end option tag is the text of the option. The text of the option is what the user is going to see, all right? So, lang underscore en, well, that... If I was a user um, and I saw lang underscore en, I might not know what it meant. I might think it's, uh, you know, um, I don't know, there's probably another country that starts with en. Um, I can't think of any, but <laughs> it, we, we could think it's some other country or some other language. You put as the text of the option what the user's going to understand. So the user's going to understand English. All right. This is what the server-side script needs. That's what the server-side script is going to understand. It's going to understand this code, a lang underscore en. So let me make the rest of these options. That's what the user is going to see, exactly. Between the start and end option tag is what the user is going to see. Spanish might be a better example, ES. ES is, stands for Espanol, which is Spanish. But ES could be Estonian, right? I guess. I don't know. You know, I suppose it could be. And therefore, a user wouldn't necessarily know that's what ES is. So English, Spanish, third one was Chinese simplified or traditional. Fourth one was Icelandic. And the fifth one was French. So now let's go and view this page. A drop down. So the user sees things that the user hopefully will understand. All right? And yet, when we do a search, it sends the code that the, browser, that the server needs. The lang underscore zh zh dash tw. old English. All right. 
questions about this? So when you're designing a form, one of the key things to do is to pick the right form control, right? And if there is only a limited list of, of possible values for something, you would not pick a text box. You would pick a drop down, maybe, or maybe a radio button, which we'll talk about radio buttons in a minute here. All right. Does everyone understand this, though? Does everyone understand the possibility or, or the reason that we would use this and, and how we did it with the text and the value? OK. Let's make a second version of this page. Actually, this is a search through Google. The heading said search through Bing. Notice, by the way, that I changed this a little bit because we're now doing the search through Google instead of Bing. So I have the action go to Google's site and do the search through Google instead of through Bing. And notice that the name of the field is AS underscore Q and not Q because that's what Google's expecting. Um, Especially in this case, Google's expecting the AS because we're doing an advanced search. We're doing a search for language. All right, I'm going to make a second version of this page, and I'm going to use a radio button instead. All right. Radio buttons work pretty much the same idea. A radio button is like the radio buttons in your car, all right? In other words, you can't have two radio stations playing at the same time, all right, theoretically. All right. Um, you press one button, and it goes off the old station, and it goes on the new station. So it's not going to be playing both. It's going to play one or the other. So a radio button is like a drop down in that it's only going to have one value. So you pick a radio station, just like you pick a language. Now, there are some goofy ways you can configure a drop-down to allow more than one option, but we're not going to talk about those. We're going to do, we, we did just the most basic form of a drop-down where there's only one option. Radio buttons are like that. There's only one option. Now, a radio button uses the input tag again. The type is radio. I'm going to get rid of this label tag. We'll come back to the labels in a minute. But I'm going to get rid of this label tag for now. The name is going to be the same for all the radio buttons in a group. All right? That's what makes them a group. If you gave each radio button a different name, then they would work independently from each other. And that's not what you want. Yeah, you want, in this case, I want to have four choices that are mutually exclusive. So I'm going to give them each the same name. So then the browser knows to treat them like a group. Radio buttons have a value, just like an option did. And the value is going to be, again, similar to what we did with the option. So English. Spanish. Notice I'm keeping the name of them the same. That'll make them work as a group.
form two. All right, there we go. We have the radio button. So I can type in what I'm searching for. And I can select the one that I want. So I can select English or Spanish. Notice when I click Spanish, English goes away. Um, it gets unchecked. The other thing by default is that radio buttons are circular. All right, there's something that's very similar to a radio button called a checkbox. And usually you can tell the difference between them because the checkboxes are squared and the radio buttons are circled. So these act as a unit because each one has its own, or each one has the same name as the others do. If I were to go and give one a different name, let's give two of them a different name. I could check Icelandic and English didn't get unchecked. Why didn't it get unchecked? Because it doesn't, the browser doesn't know that they're all part of the same group because they have different names. So French and Icelandic would work as a group, and these three would work as a group, but all five wouldn't work as a group unless all five of them have the same name. And now they all work as a group again. If you had to decide on using, so we could use a radio button or a drop down for this, and both of them work just the same. So we do a search, and there it goes. There's our French search, or Chinese, or whatever. If you were doing this project for real, would you use a radio button or a drop down? Okay. Wow, unanimous. How often is that? that? Like everyone agrees on the same thing. Why did you say drop down? It looks cleaner. Yeah. Especially. Oh, I'm. Go ahead. Exactly. You can with a drop down. You can more effectively show when there's a lot of options. Uh, you can show them in in a concise space. Exactly. Because if we really did this, there's more than five languages, right? And we would have, there's probably a few hundred languages, right? And could you imagine having a checkbox for all the, these? It would work from a technical level, but it probably wouldn't be good from a design level. Uh, how, I, how can I put them alphabetical? Excellent question. Um, let's talk about the order. Pardon me? Yeah. Excellent. Um, that, uh, how can you put the languages alphabetical order? All right. First of all, is alphabetical order always the best? Here's a hint. If I ever ask a question that has the word always in it, the answer is no, right? Because you know, there aren't too many things that are always true. All right. When would alphabetical order not necessarily be the best option? Okay. Yeah. Uh, alphabetical wouldn't necessarily be the best choice if there was clearly a default value. For example, let's say we're writing this website uh, for a Mexican company. All right. Well, most of their people are going to search in Spanish. Right. So you would put Spanish at the top of the list. All right. And then maybe you would put the second choice. So maybe English would be the second choice. And then maybe the rest would be alphabetical. All right? Um, so the, how, do, how do I want to say it? There should be some rhyme or reason behind the order of, of, of the, the, the items in the list. All right? Alphabetical is certainly one good way to organize stuff. And alphabetical would be good if you were truly doing an international site where you really didn't know the language that most people were going to be using, all right? Um, where it could be a one of, you know, any number of different sites, uh, any number of different languages. 
So alphabetical has that advantage, that it would work if there was no clear default. The other choices would be like if there was a logical order, like what year of high school are you in? Well, you wouldn't necessarily put that in alphabetical order, right? Because what would it be in alphabetical order? Freshman, junior, senior, sophomore, right? That doesn't make sense. The logical order would be freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or maybe senior, junior, sophomore, freshman, depending on, on the question. So there's a lot of different ways, but there should be some logical reason for it. Here's the thing about drop-downs, though. A drop-down, the top choice becomes the default. All right? So the top choice is a default. Some of you may have done C-sharp programming. I think uh, in C-sharp, you can have a drop-down that doesn't have any value. All right? In, uh, in web forms, a drop-down always has a value. All right? If you have not said which one is defaulted, um, then it's the top one, is the default. That's not true for radio buttons. Radio buttons, when you load up the page, all of them are unchecked. You can, check, you can tell the page to check one of them by saying checked equals checked. So if I want to make English the default, I could do that by saying checked equals checked. And then by default, that would be the one that was checked. I can do the same thing on a drop down simply by saying selected equals selected on the option. But usually you don't do that with a drop down. If you want it to be the default, you'll put it at the top of the list. All right? What if, again, so how would you make literally what you would do in this case to alphabetize them is you would have to literally alphabetize them. There's no way to say sort. Now, that's the bad news, all right? I'll come with the good news in a minute. So you'd have to sort them. I'm not going to go through that trouble. Because again, it's too early to think in alphabetical order, all right? Um, here's the good news. Chances are, this list of values is going to come from a database. In other words, your company will probably have a database of all the countries that they deal with and their language codes. In which case, you would write your database query to be sorted by alphabetical order. And again, that gets to be server-side scripting. All right? In other words, you wouldn't manually write a giant drop-down list. For example, if you go to register for classes, I think there's a drop-down where once you pick the class, or once you pick the department, it shows you a list of all the classes in that. Well, someone didn't go in and alphabetize to put CISS 115 first and CISS 121 second and CIS 122. Someone didn't do that. That page was created by uh, a server-side script that read the database for all the CISS classes and told the database to sort them in that order and produce them that way. So the good news is that when you learn server-side scripting, you will probably write code to sort this. So you won't have to manually go through and sort this. But just in HTML, if you were doing just a plain old HTML site without server-side scripting, you would have to manually alphabetize them. What if you didn't want to default with a drop-down? What would you have to do? If you didn't want to default with a drop-down, you'd have to put a dummy choice. Please select, yep, please select language.
something like that. And then that would be the top choice, and then you could pick underneath that. Now, how do you prevent them from selecting that? That typically is going to be done via server-side scripting. Oh, I'm sorry, JavaScript. So like I can right now go and type in search and leave it on please select language. And we'll do my query and it will default it to no default language. All right. But if I didn't want them to say, if I didn't want them to be able to select this dummy selection, I'd have to write some JavaScript code to prevent that from happening. All right. Now, I'm just going to show you something. And it, you know, if you have a chance over the weekend, take a look at it. I know there's a lot going on in this class. The design is due today. Uh, and again, please bring any questions to my attention. But there's two things that I do in this one, the, ones with, the one with the drop down. I use some style to make the form look nice or look nicer. Let's put it that way. So next week, we're going to talk about some of the other form controls that you have besides these three that we talked about, four actually if you count the submit button. We're going to talk about styling forms, how to make them look good. And we're going to talk about accessibility. Accessibility is where this label tag comes in, all right? because this label tag is a way to associate a piece of text with a field. Uh, on the form. So we'll talk about those three things on Monday and then Wednesday, uh, probably either sometime Wednesday or, or sometime Monday or Wednesday, we'll get into the next topic, which are tables. All right, we'll see you in lab.